Welcome back to Faith Team TV and friends. Today we are continuing to look at the conflict in Israel and featuring clips created by a former leader of the official opposition and former Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Honorable Stockwell Day. This notion of Jewish people being the colonialists and somehow Muslims being there earlier is simply there is no historic evidence for that at all. And even over the centuries, when the area we call Israel was overtaken by enemies, was invaded, at times there were exiles, at no time was that land completely cleared of Jewish people. There was always a remnant who stayed there. There was always a remnant down through the thousands of years. As we all know by now, last fall's invasion of Israel by the terrorist organization Hamas has led to an ongoing conflict in Gaza and demonstrations from parties on all sides all over the world. Last week, we aired a special segment produced by the Honorable Stockwell Day, former Minister of Foreign Affairs in Canada and also former leader of the official opposition. In those clips, we look specifically at the origins of Hamas, who they are, what their aims are, and expressed goals. This week, we are picking up the conversation with more insightful analysis, this time looking at the history of the land of Israel, who lived there when, who has historical claim to the land, and why. These clips have been pre-prepared by the Honorable Stockwell Day, and they can also be viewed in their complete form on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash day to day show. There's a lot of insightful information to cover today. Day. So without any further delay, let's get to it. They don't want to kill us and kick us from here, from Israel, and they will get our land from the Bible. You understand? Yes. yes. That's it they, they want. They mm. don't want peace. Mm. They want to kill us and that's it. And we just now, all Israel understand it, and the world must understand it. Wish me to come back home. This is, will be the best. Yes, to go back home. Just to go back home, that's what they want. So we've been looking at the issues around lessons learned from October 7th. And among the things we've considered is, of course, what seems to be the central issue, and that is the question or the debate about land. And this suggestion that the Israelis, the Jews, in fact, are somehow settlers on the land. And in fact, it's the Palestinians, the Islamists, who were there first. And folks, that just couldn't be further from the truth. Even historians who don't believe that Abraham necessarily talked to God, people do agree on the archaeological record and on the written record, on the oral record, people do agree about the approximate time that Abraham made the declaration that this land was going to be given to the Jewish people and he began the process of getting them ready to settle. And folks, that was almost 4,000 years ago and it was almost 3,000 years after that, 2,700 years to be exact, that we have the prophet Muhammad, the founder of Islam, talking about Abraham, talking about what Abraham had said almost 2,700 years earlier, and Muhammad himself makes no claim that the Muslims were there in that land before the Jews. He acknowledges Abraham's presence there 2,700 years, even before the founding of the religion of Islam. It doesn't really matter what criteria we're using here. Biblical history, archaeology that exists today and, and that has been substantiated 
by people of all faiths and even archaeologists who don't profess to have any particular faith. Uh, where they talk about DNA, where they're talking about the genealogies of the Jewish people, which are acknowledged to be the most detailed in all of history in terms of the following of the people, far, far back and far better than Ancestry.ca, proving their existence there, proving the Jewish people on that land centuries and centuries before the Islamic uh, religion. And so we have the situation where the land clearly is the issue of dispute but this notion of the uh, Jewish people being the colonialists and somehow Muslims being there earlier is simply there is no historic evidence for that at all. And even over the centuries, at different times, when the area we call Israel was overtaken by enemies, was invaded, at times there were exiles, at no time was that land completely cleared of Jewish people. There was always a remnant who stayed there. There was always a remnant down through the thousands of years who stayed in that land even at times of exile and conquer. Even this notion of the word Palestine, you know, at the time, especially the time of David, there was uh, an alliance of five cities of uh, people that were not Jewish, that were constant thorns in the flesh to Israel. Uh, you remember David in the famous story when he takes on Goliath. Goliath was a Philistine, so there were people in the area of this five-city alliance uh, called Philistines. That particular area, those particular group of people, they were actually completely conquered in 604 BC by Nebuchadnezzar II. They were absorbed into the Babylonian Empire and basically disappeared, were never heard from again. And it wasn't until 132, there was a very strong and famous rebellion by Simon Bar Kokhba, uh, a Jewish leader, and they were, uh, Israel was under Roman rule at that time, and it was a very strong and an almost successful rebellion. And that's when this name, Palestinia, started to come back. It was meant as an insult by the Romans once they conquered and put down that particular rebellion. It was following that rebellion that the Romans moved many people out of what we call Israel. But by no means did they all leave. Obviously, the biblical record shows there was still a very strong presence. But the Romans, uh, among other areas of insulting and showing the Jewish people, they completely crushed them. They set up their own god. The Romans did Jupiter to be the uh, god over Israel's god and they referred to the area as Saraya Palestinia or Palestine as an insult to the Jews. It was after that particular uh, time of, of Christ and then going into the first few centuries in the Middle East, we saw certainly the Romans continue to rule the area, increasing influence of Christians as Christianity began to grow and again, different forms of government taking place. But it wasn't until 637, 637 after the time of Christ that we see the Muslim forces. Remember, um, Muhammad had just founded the Islamic religion. They were conquering all the, the lands around them. They actually conquered the area, which we call Israel, conquered Jerusalem, and moved in there. And from that time on, from 637 uh, AD, then there were a period of about, uh, there was a very interesting period of, of Islamic rule, and then over that period, nine different crusades of, uh, from coming from various areas, as, as you know and you recall, liberating the area, and then it being invaded again, and living, and that carried on right into the 1100s. And um, again, Jews always being in the area, some leaving and running for their lives, but many staying. Always a remnant of Jewish people staying in the land that we call Israel. The next significant date to be aware of is 1517 AD, the uh, so-called Ottoman Empire which truly then uh, took control, not just of the Middle East, but of many areas around there that included what we call Israel, included Jerusalem. 
And the Ottoman Empire reigned and ruled there for about 400 years. It was very significant. Again, many Jewish people still living in the area and always a strong remnant, but we were also seeing the widespread dispersal of Jews all around the world, principally into Europe, but also into other areas. In the late 1800s, anti-Semitism was rampant in most places in Europe, and especially so in France. And something took place there called the Dreyfus Affair, where a soldier in the French army, an officer who was also Jewish, was falsely accused of treason. And this just ignited protests and riots across the country. Uh, he was taken to court. He, it was, uh, he was falsely charged. And uh, it just caught the attention of many people, and especially a writer, a reporter, by the name of Theodore Herzl, a Jewish man. And he began to see this as kind of the tipping point. This was the, the pinnacle of outrage and hatred, anti-Semitism against the Jews. It was in other parts of Europe also, but especially so in France. And he began to encourage, he began to form groups and encourage the Jewish people, get out of Europe, get out of France, head back to Israel and carve out an existence in that somewhat uh, barren land. As a matter of fact, right at the close of the 1800s, he approached the Ottoman Emperor uh, Abdul Hamim, and he asked for that land to be officially declared Jewish land or Israel, belonging to the Jewish people. Now, of course, the um, Ottoman leader at the time, uh, the Sultan um, Hamim, did not agree to that, but he did grant a charter, very interesting, granted a charter to the Jews, which gave them the right and allowed them to return to that particular land that we call Israel, and quite a significant return began to, began to uh, get a, move, a movement uh, right across Europe. Jewish people by the thousands were leaving uh, outrageous persecution and discrimination in Europe and moving back to carve themselves out a living in what was then some pretty raw land known as Israel. Well, the First World War rolled around and the Sultan and the Ottoman Empire and the Islamists, unfortunately, uh, picked the wrong horse in that race, siding with Germany. Of course, Germany lost that war. And it was at that time that the Ottoman Empire completely collapsed and, and disappeared. And at that time also, the British were given a mandate to rule over Israel, it's called the British Mandate. At that time, there was a, a very clear indication from Britain and from the other countries that had defeated Germany that there was going to be some kind of official recognition of a homeland for the Jewish people in Israel. That was put in place, and under the British mandate, and that was signed uh, very famously, a name you would uh, know and have heard about, uh, Arthur Balfour at the time was the foreign secretary in Britain. He put the signature to it, saying that this land, indeed, though it was still under the mandate of Britain, was one day going to become Jewish, it was going to become uh, a land designated as a homeland for Jews, and they were going to call it Israel. So that mandate continued from Britain to Israel for about 25 years, and then the Second World War came around uh, once again. The uh, Muslim nations made a bad choice. They supported Hitler. The Grand Mufti in Jerusalem was a major supporter of Hitler. And of course, uh, the Germans, Hitler, uh, lost the war. The Nazis lost the war. And it was then when the absolute, the sheer horror, the staggering atrocity of the Holocaust started to really um, make people aware of just how horrendous the attack on the Jewish people had been. And it made people realize the Jewish people need to have that homeland designated. see Israel, hoping as a sign of, of good faith, pulls out of Gaza completely. And we see what a horrible, horrible uh, job Hamas did in terms of trying to bring any kind of sense of stability to that area. 
We love Canada, and we want to see it strong for generations to come. That's why we do this show. We can't do it alone. We need your help. Unlike commercial TV, this program is 100% donor funded. If you'd like to see more episodes produced on important issues for our nation, please consider signing up to be a monthly partner or giving a special gift today. Every gift makes a real difference, and all gifts are tax deductible. Together, we can build a better Canada for the future. Visit fayteen.tv or call 1 866 844 0844 to donate today. And so it was that the issue was taken to the United Nations in 1947. Majority of the nations in the United Nations voted designating Israel as the homeland for the Jewish people on May 1st, 1948, a great day of uh, celebration. That official designation took place. Israel became, in fact, designated and became officially the homeland for the Jewish people. And the day after that designation, the five Islamic nations that surrounded Israel declared war on this brand new country and said they were going to obliterate this new country from the face of the earth. And so it was that the world watched, they had, the world had voted at the UN and recognized Israel's right to exist as a Jewish country, as a Jewish state, but everybody stood back and there was a pretty strong feeling that these five Islamic nations were in fact going to destroy this brand new country. We all know that that didn't happen. Some refer to it as a miracle, but Israel won. Something very interesting to note that was taking place right at this time. Many Islamist, many of the Arabs in the area that was Israel were told by the Islamic nations, move out of there, get out of there because we're coming in, we're going to obliterate Israel. At the same time, Israelis, Jewish, uh, sorry, Jewish people were being kicked out of the Islamic nations that they had lived in for centuries that surrounded Israel. They were told, you get out or you die. And the uh, Muslim people, or what became known as the Palestinian people, about 700,000 of them left, thinking they would come back one day and that the Islamic nations were going to destroy Israel. And that did not happen, as we know. Israel won. Israel absorbed about a million Jewish people into this little country at about that time, and not one Islamic nation surrounding Israel took in any of the Palestinians, not one. They became an orphaned people. So it's very important to keep this in mind that not one nation, not one Islamic nation surrounding Israel would take in any of Palestinians. Their particular uh, brand of Islam, which was fueled by hatred from narrow splinter groups, eventually uh, like Hamas, which we'll talk about in a minute, frankly made them odious to the, their own cousins in the other Islamic nations. Many Arab Muslims did stay in Israel and became citizens, voting citizens with first and, and uh, with the same type of rights as Jews, and that was to continue. But the promise of peace was given to the Palestinians at each time there was a war against Israel. There was a famous war, as we know, in 1948. We just talked about it. And then there was the war in 1967, and then the war in 1973, the Yom Kippur War. In each of those cases, Israel won miraculously, and to everybody's surprise, and in each case, they they took over the land from which they had been attacked, the geographic areas in each of those cases from which they had been attacked. But they said very clearly, Israel said to any of the countries that from the attacks uh, where they had come from, they said, look, if you sign a peace treaty with us, we give back that land, but we cannot expose ourselves to this ongoing attack. So that was the premise and the promise that was laid out for the other Islamic nations. And history shows Israel kept its promise in that regard. So it's very important to watch what happened through time up until, really, until October 7th. Uh, different nations, Arab nations, started to recognize Israel's right to exist. 1979, Egypt formed a, a peace pact with Israel, recognized their right to exist, and guess what? The land that Israel had taken after they were attacked by the Egyptians in 67, Israel kept its word, 
gave back that land to the Egyptians. And then, to the horror and the frustration and the, the hatred of this Palestinian movement, 1994 rolls around, Jordan now signs peace with Israel. Jordan now recognizes Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. What did Israel do? As promised, they gave back the two areas that they had taken when they'd been attacked from Jordan. And then in 1994, we see the Palestinian Liberation Organization itself recognize Israel, recognize Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. So the people who hated Israel, hated the concept of Israel, and hated the Jews were being forced into a smaller and smaller corner. But as we're going to see, they made that corner a very explosive corner almost a thermonuclear one, and this is one of the things that led up to October 7th. This is the mission. We still have people in Hamas captivity, right, right. and they need to come back home. There is no other way. Mm -hmm. They know that to be there, they deserve better than being held by Hamas mm -hmm. in Gaza right now. And for you sharing that with the world means a lot. So as more countries and more organizations that were um, Islamic began to recognize Israel's right to exist, this infuriated this small group, a rump group, if we can call it that, of extreme Islamists, and they formed, as we studied in our previous episode, 1988, the group called Hamas formed. They told the Muslim Brotherhood that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was just not being violent enough, and they formed, and in their charter of 1988, is when Hamas said, made the clear declaration on two points. Number one, they would never settle land with Israel. They did not want to negotiate a two-country peace, a two-state peace, and they were committed to kill Jews all the time, everywhere. I think that the, this, what happened here, it's not only Israeli problem or Jewish problem, it's the world's concern. This should concern the world what happened mm, here. Absolutely. I'm Ron, I'm 29 years old. I'm in reserve and I don't want to live in a world when this is okay, when people just stand by it. When people don't speak up, when people don't say anything, when they stand by and remain silent even though they hear these things, that's very horrifying. So whether we're in Canada, whether in the United States, we must condemn everything that happened here and we must stand and support people of peace and support people who've had these losses and send a message out that we just will not tolerate it silence is not an option silence from around here and in other countries just empowers those who want to do evil the reason this is so important is because for decades all that we ever hear from mainstream media are the apparent uh, very tough things that happen at the border to Palestinian people. The truth is, Palestinians by the thousands come into Israel every day. They have jobs there because they're robbed of jobs in Gaza and other areas due to Hamas. They come in for work. They come in for free health care in the hospitals. And they also come in, unfortunately, to bomb and to kill and destroy. And that's why, just as you go through a difficult uh, time at times uh, going through the airport, uh, we're all searched and the same thing happens at the borders, the border in Gaza. There are and have been daily, for years, daily, it never stops, uh, bombing attempts, suicide bombing attempts, people trying to get across the border with the bomb jackets on, uh, children being equipped with bomb jackets to be sent across the border. And so there still has to be rigor at the border. But in 2005 and 2006, we see Israel, hoping as a sign of, of good faith to be interpreted that way, pulls out of Gaza completely. In 2005, 2006, gave it all back to Hamas and to the Palestinians, and we see what a horrible, horrible uh, job Hamas did in terms of trying to bring any kind of sense of stability to that area. The poison that Hamas put into the hearts and minds of the people of Palestine, the people of Gaza, made them odious even to the other Islamic nations all around them. So it's very important to keep this in mind as we come closer to October 7, 2023, 
We look now in the years about 2020 and even earlier than that, and we see the development of what uh, eventually became known as the Abrahamic Accords, the Accords of Abraham. These accords, to the wonder of the world, but to the shock and horror of Hamas, more and more Islamic nations now recognizing Israel's right to exist, Israel's right to the land, and Israel's right to peace. So here, along with the United States, we see uh, the United Arab Emirates, we see Bahrain, we see Sudan, we see Morocco, one country after another, through these Abrahamic Accords, recognizing Israel. And then um, with the world watched in, in amazement, then as other countries, Indonesia, Niger, Mauritania, Somalia, Sudan, all stepping up through these accords to sign peace and recognition of Israel. And this was the worst nightmare of Hamas, to see other Islamic nations coming around and settling and recognizing Israel it's right to exist, and this became the genesis of this, the evil and most horrific uh, date since the Holocaust, October 7th. It was done by Hamas. They could not stand the reality of Islamic nations starting in an increasing wave to recognize Israel, and so they put in place what was going to be seen on October the 7th as a horrific, horrific attack on Israel. The main reason for the vicious attacks of October 7th to be as shocking, as horrific, as violent, and as brutal as they are, to guarantee there would be a strong reaction from Israel to defend itself. That is what happened, and that is what we are dealing with to this day, along with the continued promise of Hamas to keep these attacks going. But we must not be complacent. Our day will come, but we must normalize massacres as the status quo. As the status quo. As the status quo. Thank you for joining us today for these remarks and insights from the Honorable Stockwell Day. If you want to watch this program again or share it with your friends and loved ones, please visit Faithteen.tv or our YouTube channel where this show is posted along with other previous episodes for your viewing ease. You can also visit the Honorable Stockwell Day's YouTube channel directly at youtube.com forward slash day today show. Just like and subscribe these channels and you will be alerted every single time that new segments are posted. For those of you that give on a regular basis to keep us on air, thank you so much. We appreciate you. And these shows and conversations could not be broadcast across Canada without your very generous support. So to sign up to become a monthly partner or give a special gift today, simply visit fateen.tv to give securely online or to see other giving options. You can also give our team a call anytime at 1-866-844-0844. And we would be honored to serve you over the phone and even and pray for your personal prayer needs. Please don't forget, we also have an email list that you can sign up for, as well as a free smartphone app that you can download. And when you do either of those, you will be notified every single time a new show is released so that you never miss an episode. Lastly, once again, we want to remind you that our team really is here to pray for you, our faithful viewers, and our supporters. So please do call us anytime if you have a personal prayer request or a question that we can serve you in answering. Thanks so much for joining me. I hope to see you next week.